Welcome to the addendum, a thing added. On this podcast, Pastor Eric Williams will add to, clarify, and supplement the most recent teachings at Fellowship Renewed Church. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is still talking about food offered to idols, and one thing that he does in the text uh, from Sunday is he talks about the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And so we spent some time looking at angels and demons for that reason. And so what I'd like to do today is look a little bit more into to this issue and address two topics. One, can Christians be possessed by demonic spirits? And number two, what else do we know about the demonic world from Scripture as far as their ultimate fate, where they are now, what they're doing, what they've done in the past. And I'm, I'm going to draw that out from, uh, from two, uh, two New Testament passages in reference to an Old Testament event. Okay? So first, can Christians be possessed by demonic spirits? Let's answer that. Two primary texts and one of application uh, helps us to understand this. Let me... Let me read the most basic first to get the the idea out there. 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There is no indication that he who is in us is anything other than the Spirit of God. There is no indication that he who is in us is the Spirit of God and being challenged by another spirit within us that is a demonic spirit. He who is in us is, is, a, is a reality that is permanent for the believer. So when the Spirit of God enters our life, it is he who is in us and not another. And that doesn't change. And so I'm arguing that the scriptures tell us that once the Spirit of God comes in you, uh, another spirit is not allowed, cannot come inside the believer. Okay? How else might we argue that? And are there any passages that people would use to argue to the contrary? Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 is a discussion about spiritual warfare. And it's a text that I read, at least in part, on Sunday. And l- let me just read that text for you. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, and in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Okay? So this is about this cosmic battle that believers are engaged in, okay? And where where is this battle taking place? Well, it's a spiritual battle. It's Although there are tangible elements to it, right? Um, The way it actually surfaces itself to us are in things that we hear, see, taste, touch, right? Feel. Um, But what is the cause of those events? The, The cause of those events is behind them. Okay, there is a spiritual world of influence that for the most part is unseen to us, although the scripture pulls back a veil that we might see by the Spirit of God, okay? Um, But let, let me just point something out here. In this battle, in the instructions that Paul is giving to the church in Ephesus, it never says, in this spiritual battle, uh, simply call on someone to come and cast the Spirit out of you, or cast the spirit out yourself. There's no indication here that 
the battle is is from an, the inside working out as far as demonic uh, spiritual forces are concerned, spiritual forces of evil. Now, there are spiritual forces of evil working from outside of us to attack us from the outside, okay? But working within us is always the indication of the Spirit of God working within us to push out our sinful past, our sinful nature. So the Spirit of God is working within us to push out evil, whereas the, the evil spirits are working from without, from outside of us, trying to push evil and sin in. Okay? But there is no indication that something is happening actually inside of us that is from a spiritual standpoint, from a demonic spirit working inside of us, okay, that needs to be pushed out. Some would argue from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, that, well, it could be that there is something that is working inside of us that we need to overcome. And that is, uh, so uh, don't get me wrong here, um, because I'm thinking about how my words can be interpreted, and I'm not saying that sin is working within us, right? That's no doubt. That is happening. That is a true internal spiritual battle, but that's not what we're talking about right now. So just understand where this conversation is actually pointed. We're talking about demonic spiritual influence. We're talking about demonic spirits residing inside of believers. That's the conversation we're having, okay? Um, what about 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6? What does it say? It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Okay, is this passage from Paul to the church in Corinth talking about demonic spirits residing inside of believers that we have divine power to bind them and get them out. Is, is that what's being said? And I'm saying, no, that's not what's being said because Paul actually defines what these strongholds are in the text, and it is not demonic spirits, okay? He says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. And some would say, aha, see, there it is. But Paul defines what we're destroying, what these strongholds are, In if you just go to verse 5. Verse 5 says, we destroy, what is it we're destroying? Arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's what's being destroyed there, okay? That's what's being taken captive, Okay, this is like warfare, siege warfare, actually. And I did a whole Wednesday night series on this idea of taking every thought captive. And so uh, I would encourage you uh, to go uh, watch or listen to that. But the point here being is that this is not about demonic uh, possession. This is not about Christians being possessed by demonic spirits. Okay, um, however... There is an indication that the thoughts and arguments may have uh, a demonic origin. Paul talks about that uh, to Timothy, uh, that some are led astray by the teaching of demons. And so certainly that's a reality. But again, that's external uh, coming at us, not something internal that needs to be taken captive. Okay? So... Uh, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, and he who is in us stays, and he who is in us is the only one in us, okay? The second idea I'd like to address, and I'll, I'll do so briefly this morning, but it's about the history and future of demons, demonic spirits, who we know are fallen angels, as we talked about on Sunday. Let me read first out of 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6. It says, For... If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, 
If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. What is all of this a reference to? Now, remember, this is Peter. Peter knew what he was talking about, okay? Uh, in this section, there is a reference to an Old Testament story that is extremely brief. And it's at the, in, the, in the days of Noah, as, as Peter references here, right? He's talking about Noah. Was there another situation during the time of Noah that was about angels sinning? And if angels are sinning, what type of angels are they? What category do they belong to? The elect angels or the non-elect angels? Are they the holy angels of God or are they fallen angels? Well, if they're sinning, they're not God's servants, are they? So these are certainly fallen angels, and they're sinning a particular way. Genesis 6, 1 through 4, let me read it for you. When man began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. They took, their, they took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Okay, this is the story that's being referenced. Okay, a couple of questions are, who are the sons of God? Um, pretty much any time this phrase, sons of God, is used, it is talking about God's heavenly assembly. Uh, you can see this in the introduction to Job, if you go there, and it's pretty plain what's being said there. Angelic beings, one who is like a son of God, is referenced in Daniel, and that's a reference to angels. So, we can be certain that the sons of God reference here is to something outside of mankind, okay? And in other places, sons of God is a reference to and angels, okay, angelic figures. Another question we have here is who are the Nephilim? Um, there, are, there are really two options here, and I'm just going to say that um, there, there are a couple of different ways to understand this, and I think that one is better than the other, all right? One option is that the Nephilim are giants produced by this breeding of angels and, and women. So they had offspring, and these were the great men of renown. Okay, Another option of interpretation that I think is actually very attractive is that Moses is demythologizing the Nephilim, that there are genealogies found that, that trace the greatness of the Nephilim and how some were saying that angels were actually the cause of the sinfulness of humanity. And Moses is saying, listen, the Nephilim were there before this event happened, and the Nephilim were there after this event happened. So angels are not the cause of humanity's sinfulness. It's actually humanity that's the cause of humanity's sinfulness. Okay? But either way, uh, the New Testament makes commentary on this. And notice what these angels did, these fallen angels. Remember, uh, as we talked about some time ago, uh, that, that marriage is not eternal, and the uh, marriage does not exist in the eternal state because we will be like angels. Remember, angels in heaven do not marry, nor are they given in marriage. But these angels, when they left their proper realm of authority, which is heaven, what did they do? They married. So, yeah, angels married, fallen angels married human women, um, but they left heaven. They left their proper dwelling place to do so. And they had inappropriate sexual relationships and God judged them for that. And this is what Peter's referencing. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he cast them into hell. He committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Uh, and then he starts to talk about Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. See, there's a connection between the sexual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sexual sin of angels and that God is judging all these activities. Okay, that's from Peter. But another place that actually confirms this is Jude 5 through 7. No chapters in the book of Jude, but Jude verses 5 through 7. 
And it says, Now I want to remind you, although that you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but they left their proper dwelling. Okay, that's, that's a reference to this situation where fallen angels left their proper dwelling. They left heaven. Um, and they did what God uh, was not pleased with. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the day of judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. So they serve as an example of those undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Okay, so um, both Peter and Jude confirm this about the fallen angels, that there were some of them who abandoned heaven, and they came, and because they saw that the daughters of men were attractive, that they pursued unnatural sexual desire, which you also see in Sodom and Gomorrah, and what happened to both of these, is that they are experiencing the punishment of God. No one escapes. The people in Noah's day didn't escape. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't escape. Even angels, when they sin, do not escape the punishment of God. And so all of this is a warning to us. They didn't escape. Do you think you will? And so this brings us back to Paul's exhortation. Flee from idolatry do not provoke the lord to jealousy are you stronger than he thank you for joining us on the addendum podcast for more information about fellowship renewed church visit frcsparta.com please join us for next week's episode